All right, last session. Everybody's holding up. So for those who have seen me, seen me for two or three times, I apologize. <laughs> um, on the last session of the day, so um, my name is Scott Kelly, I'm account executive from Cloudera. And I'm here to introduce uh, folks from ServiceLink. And um, I think they're very excited to come up here and present. So uh, Akshay and Byung Jun, uh, take it away. Thank you, Scott. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Akshay. I'm here with uh, my colleague, Byung Jun. Uh, we are both from ServiceLink. Uh, for people who do not know what ServiceLink is, we are the uh, industry leaders in mortgage services. So when I say mortgage services, we handle entire lifetime of a mortgage. It starts with when you go to a bank and uh, approach a bank for mortgage uh, against a property, uh, the bank has to go ahead and send someone for the appraisers, uh, appraisal of the property to know whether the uh, property is actually that valuable. Now that uh, is the appraisal business. Then we have uh, to know whether the property is safe to be uh, given mortgage for. That is the title uh, search. Uh, then we also, uh, after all of that is settled, uh, you pay the down payment and then uh, you have a bunch of documents to sign. That is the closing. You get the, uh, the keys of the property after that. There is also a behind the scene uh, aspect that's, uh, that goes on, which is known as post-closing. Uh, then you have the mortgage payments. Uh, so, and, I, and also, uh, if the property goes, uh, unfortunately, into foreclosure, we maintain the property as well as uh, 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 perform uh, auction uh, for that, help a performing auction for that. So as you can see, ServiceLink provides all the applications from uh, start point till the end uh, for a mortgage. Uh, so probably if you have bought a house within the last 40 years, uh, your mortgage was processed through our system. Uh, it's not as easy as it sounds. There are so many different lines of businesses which we need to uh, maintain. Uh, so we are, our, our uh, aim is to facilitate and enhance your home buying experience. We want to make sure that uh, you can buy uh, a house and do all the transactions on your uh, smart devices. Uh, it's not, uh, as I mentioned, it's not as easy as that today. Uh, we are going to be talking about uh, we are going to be talking about the challenges which we faced in making uh, one of these uh, applications, the challenges and uh, the technology uh, which we used in order to uh, uh, in order to overcome those. So to, uh, so today, uh, as the topic mentioned, we are going to be talking about batch and real time analytics. So let's start with batch analytics. Uh, so what is uh, what is in the capsule of uh, batch analytics? There is uh, <clears throat> there is data from different uh, data data coming in from different sources, different uh, formats that needs to be loaded and transformed into a uniform uh, uh, uniform uh, uh, a, a uniform uh, 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 structure. Then there is uh, KPI, uh, key performance indicators. Of, like uh, we we have made them configurable, dynamic KPIs. Uh, we wanted to introduce predictive and uh, predictive analytics into it. Uh, we wanted to uh, include prescriptive analytics into it. What is prescriptive analytics? Uh, so when you have a problem, the uh, the system will tell you the solution, how to resolve this issue. Previous work was done on that. Uh, it was basically uh, on a Power BI dashboard. Uh, you had, uh, and it was connected to SQL Server on the back end. Uh, all the actions taken were manual actions, so it took a large amount of time. And sometimes those actions were late and not effective. There was no parallel computing whatsoever. So the, uh, the amount of time taken for processing a large amount of volume was way too high. So what is the solution? Uh, we came up with batch analytics. So what are the steps involved in batch analytics? Uh, first step is ETL, that is extraction, transformation, and loading. You extract the data from uh, various different sources, uh, transform them, make them uniform so that it can be used uh, further in the applications. Then you load the data so that these, uh, this, this data can be used further in the uh, manipulation jobs. 
then you have those manipulation jobs, calculating the various APIs. As I mentioned, those are configurable APIs. Uh, we have uh, we have resource management framework like a Yarn UI, where uh, you can uh, assign the resources. You can look at the health of the jobs as well as uh, if the if the job fails, you will be able to see why it failed, what was the error, etc. Then there is the publisher. The publisher will take these manipulated uh, this manipulated data and publish it to a listener or a service bus, wherein the downstream market microservices can subscribe to it and then use those uh, uh, use that data in order to do whatever they want to do uh, ahead now uh, for this particular exercise we had two options there was spark and there was Hadoop map reduce so let's talk about uh, what are what they both are they both are open source project uh, developed by Apache software uh, uh, foundation the key difference between spark and Hadoop is that Spark does all the data manipulation in memory, whereas Hadoop has to read and write every time on a disk. So that makes Spark about 100 times faster than Hadoop MapReduce. Uh, another thing which made us uh, select Spark over Hadoop MapReduce is its uh, native machine learning library called MLlib. Uh, we'll talk about it uh, a bit more later. Uh, so. Spark, uh, since we decided to go ahead with Spark, to discuss a bit uh, about the Spark ecosystem, uh, it, is, uh, it has uh, Spark SQL, it has streaming, it has machine learning, it has uh, graph computation, as well as you have those APIs, the Spark programming model APIs, in different languages, which, whichever you're suitable with. Uh, there is R, SQL, Java, Scala, Python, anything, uh, any of these you want to use, you can just use the Spark programming model and uh, go ahead with it. So now, leveraging PySpark. So whenever people talk about using Spark for data manipulation, everyone assumes that you are going to use Scala. But that's not always the case. We went ahead and used PySpark. Why? It's easy. Uh, secondly, it was used, uh, it was done by data scientists, people like me, who are proficient in Python. So going from Python syntax to PySpark, is always going to be a uh, easy job rather than understanding the syntax, learning something else while doing Scala altogether. Now, readability, maintainability, and familiarity of Python cannot be beaten, especially not by Scala. Uh, then there are so many native libraries uh, uh, in Python. There is mathematical libraries like NumPy. There are machine learning libraries, Keras, TensorFlow, which you can use. There are uh, like uh, visualization tools. Uh, there are amazing visualization tools in Python using Matplotlib, Plotly, etc. Uh, now, talking about machine learning in Spark. So we uh, we trained a model to predict how good or how bad the profit is going to be going ahead for the particular period of time. How many orders are we expecting? What is the health of the market going to be? So that was used, uh, that was done using a few external, uh, a few external uh, features, uh, a few internal features. We had data for about five years. We used a time series model in order to make a predictive, uh, in order to make a predictive model out of it. The training and testing was done using the same resources which we use for batch analytics. Uh, then we have a trained model. We save it on the disk. And we have it ready to go whenever we want. We have the data, we have the trained model, and that's it. Uh, running the uh, analytics on that, you will get the predictive analytic, uh, predictive uh, data for that as well. Uh, you can also build uh, statistical models using the same batch analytics and putting in a few statistical concepts on that. You can build something like scoring uh, for someone's performance, scoring for the health of the market, uh, and uh, so. As I mentioned before, and I'm going to stress again, uh, the reason why we selected Spark and PySpark, uh, uh, you know, specifically because of the machine learning capabilities of both of them, and if needed, the external native libraries. So, what happens after that? What happens after all the manipulation is done? All the jobs are uh, all the jobs are uh, going through. Uh, uh, all the jobs are done. So what happens after that? So the data is stored on the disk. 
So uh, a snapshot of data is stored on the disk. Why? For auditing purposes. Or maybe you want to do some analysis later to check if the results are correct. So those things can be done. Uh, then the, uh, the results are then published to a listener, uh, wherein wherein the downstream uh, uh, and, uh, and the listener puts those messages into a topic or a service bus. Uh, these messages, uh, these topics can be subscribed by downstream uh, microservices in order to do visualization that is put it on the uh, UI or maybe even uh, updating the data stores. So now to talk deeper into the orchestrator and uh, to, mention, uh, to explain real-time analytics, I would like to call Byung-Jun on stage. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Akshay. So Akshay went over the analytics, analytics part of the batch analytics. Now let me take a little bit deeper dive from a little bit different perspective from the engineering perspective. So as Akshay also mentioned, the process is ETL and analytics and publisher. Let me dive a little bit into that. So ETL, that's still very similar to the ETL you usually see, extract, transform, that's the same. Load is a bit different. We parameterize the load so that each, each load that runs on a scheduled run will save to a different location. That means you can have a snapshot of databases stored in a separate, separate way. So for example, right now we have like one year's data stored in that way. You, you, just, you just think of a machine learning algorithm you want to implement, you create it, you run it with that one year snapshot, then you have output from one year's data. Also, to do that, we also had to operationalize the analytics. As you might know, writing, writing the analytics code to run on, a, run on an input data set, run analytics, provide output, that's one thing. Bringing that to production is another. So it had to be flexible and it had to be configurable. So that's what we did. Analytics data configurations, they are all parameterized. Those parameters passed as input arguments will drive the, drive the execution path of the stuff. And also this, this part is decoupled from any other microservices, well except the except one that I'm gonna talk about later. So this is an entirely different microservice. And after that, there's publisher, so that we publish to a given service bus that entertain a topic. And there, there are other microservices that subscribe to the topic, listen and process. You know what? I don't care. It's not mine. But I think they're doing a good job. All right. So this is about the batch analytics. So let us take a step back and now think about it. So Akshay, Akshay mentioned that we are doing order volume predictions. So when we get the order volume prediction, we predict the number of orders we, are, we think we're going to get based on, the, based on data on a particular day, on a particular period, on a particular area. However, we know the number of orders, but how do we know how many orders can we handle? So that links to, the, that links to how, we, how we access provider schedule and how many available, availabilities they have. So brings us to calendar. So for this calendar, it's not like we did not have this concept before. We did have an implementation in RDBMS. But because of the data structure, the tables were too many. And on all the queries that we had to issue was required too many joins on spot. And it was very hard to maintain. So we had to move out of RDBMS to NoSQL and to HBase to be exact. So why why HBase? Obviously, in NoSQL world, there are a lot of other choices, like document model, like MongoDB, or just simple row model. So the key thing we, th we wanted was performance. And then we wanted to explode the data structure to capture all, this, all the attributes that we want. Also, these exploded things, we should be able to merge and split again with ease and with performance. So that's why we chose HBase. And also, also, it was a big plus that we had an HBase offering on cloud. So we followed there. 
All right, so obviously there has been a lot of challenges in designing the calendar. And as you might know, uh, if, you, if you built anything with HBase before, the biggest challenge of building an HBase application is designing the row key, because that's, that's what makes or breaks things. And so we had to consider a lot of, lot of stuff. And to mention a few, one thing we had to, ma we had to make sure was that when you, when, when you issue a call, when you issue a call, it had to be, it had to get all the data we need for the call using one scanner, but not so many data, so we're not wasting network and I/O. It also the row key also had to make sense in in a way lexicographically sortable because H graph H base sorts the row key in lexicographical way. Also, it should avoid hot spotting. So those are the those are all the things that we had to overcome and understand. Also, we had to identify the important functionality that we wanted to optimize for, and that also drove the drove the design of the design of the HBase table. Also, we had to identify cache settings because, for performance reasons, obviously, you want your data to be in cache. But if your cache is too big, then sometimes when GC kicks in, congrats, your HBase just died. You don't want that to happen. And consistency was also a big thing because we were moving from our DBMS, which had a stricter consistency, to HBase, which had eventual consistency. We had to make sure that the use case we had works with eventual consistency. And performance goal was around 500, 600 MS, still better than what we, what we had. So this is what we did. We designed a row key that satisfies the requirement I spoke of. And we identified the use case we had to optimize for, and that drove the, that drove the row key and table, table design. Also, cache setting, as I mentioned. And also, we had to utilize a lot of parallel threading for the performance. So based, common uses of that is as something like this. You get, a, you get some kind of request. You slice them into parts, where ideally, each part will be resolvable by just just invoking a scanner to a table. You get the results back, you play with it, and then you merge at the end. So that's parallelism implementation. So here's the result of what we did. I don't, see, I don't know if you can actually see the numbers there. But uh, so from one peak hour on a day, we have 5,000 calls. I'm guessing that's some analytics call. And the average was. 88 millisecond, and from one random hour in a usual day, there's 89 calls with average of 124 millisecond. So that's like four or five times the, four or five times the better than what we expected and set out for, and even more, much more than that if you compare it to what he, what we had before. So, also, this thing is also important that we link back to analytics. So we support near real time calls to providers availability. So if you remember what I spoke at the beginning of introducing the calendar, we had to get, we had to make sure we know how many orders we can handle in an area. So we have, we have, we have list of vendors who work in that area, obviously, and we have their, we have their available hours. So we know how many orders they can handle. So we can we can just let them know, hey, this market's this market's about to have these orders, and you know what, you're short on people, go get people, or something like that. And that that obviously required a very big data crunching and a lot of calls, so that did not exist before that we have implemented, and we keep we keep record of those history of calendar, so it so the analytics people can can use that to derive some other ML algorithms if necessary. Also, it is also very easier to use. So now let me invite back Akshay for conclusion. Thank you. Uh, so in conclusion, I would just like to mention that we achieved around 90% of uh, process efficiency. Uh, uh, we were able to solve a very uh, tricky problem of availability. And also, we achieved a lot more automation than what was there before. Thank you so much for your attention. Have a good day. Uh, any questions? Uh, uh,
Uh, yes. Uh, how do you, what do you use to handle the metadata? Uh, handle what? The metadata. Metadata for? Uh, the, uh, the data element definitions and the process and transformation definitions that the data goes through. Mm -hmm. Do you mean the orchestrator? So, well, metadata metadata is just dropped. So basically, what when we when we do the ETL, we only extract the information we needed for the for the data analytics. So we have the list of list of list of columns that we needed and list of data. So we only got those parts. So how about the KPI definitions? Like you know, let's say what the mean time to close is or something like that. There's yeah, so the KPI definitions were provided by the businesses. Uh, everything uh, those experts think that are important, uh, those KPIs were calculated and whatever configuration they thought that, you know, this is the configuration we require for this particular KPI, that was uh, able to be done within the application itself. And that that is configurable too, that's stored in a different database and that that definition at the time of ETL is brought in and stored there as a snapshot. Okay. The, way our, the, the way our process is structured is each layer has its different KPI. Mm -hmm. That basically uh, was the reason why we had to go into a dynamically configurable API. If you take a valuation business and process of your own buying, where you apply for the market and then you have the appraiser for coming in, appraising your house, and then you have the inspector coming in doing the inspection, then you have a title closing and then and a title uh, check, and then you have the closing that you've done. So each of these four attributes have different metrics mm -hmm. we measure. And Kind of all of them contribute to an SLA, each of them has its own SLA. But for us, the overall SLA is, is the key. In order to achieve the overall SLA, we have to create these pockets of them in the KPI when we have the individual measures that we use there. So that's, that's basically what's determined. That. And to going back to the metadata part of it, when we use the edge space and we converted all the relational structures into a single row, that kind of took away the metadata because for us, it's one string of rows, it's basically what a metadata is. Mm -hmm. that's, that's basically what happened. Okay. Yeah. Can you just talk about a real-time use case? Because I saw you have here, so in mortgage processing or post-processing, where did you see the real-time use case? So um, we have a real-time use case in multiple ways within, within the valuation process. Right? So we need to understand more from a, if I, if I drill down from a predictive to the prescriptive and then where it comes in is, we have the models in place where we identify, okay, here's what uh, the volume of water is that we're gonna get, right? But then from a prescriptive aspect, of it, thank you. From the prescriptive side of it, we also know our capacity to handle those volume. The SLAs define the real thing. The moment we get a particular order, it needs to be assigned in, in an hour or two to a particular vendor or a provider. Right? And, and within that particular gap of an hour or two hours, we need to understand whether we really have the capacity to take in the order and provide it in that particular market. If it does not, then I need to basically escalate that to my uh, regional manager over there to take the corrective action. So with this model, what we have also done is 80 to 90% of the corrective actions the system is taking. Because it, we have defined the rules and conditions for X, Y, Z, PQR is your action. You just have to go and do it. If you have a vendor that is prioritized and is a good guy, you just go and assign the order, send him an alert that it needs to happen. So we have defined rules on that. 80 to 90% of the corrective actions the system is taking. The balance 20% is where it gets escalated to the regional manager uh, to manually take the actions. So we have that, not quote unquote real time, but we have a near real time need in there to meet that, to meet that as a lane. Yeah. Who are your competitors? Anybody who's into the mortgage processing business? No, basically our clients are big banks. All the, all the lenders, we call them as the bigger banks um, across the United States are, are, our, um, are our clients. But we have a lot of uh, competitors in here who actually does these processing across the nation. Yeah, CodeLogic is one of them, yeah. Who is the cloud provider? Yeah, so, um, ServiceLink is a part of an FNF family, uh, Fidelity National Financial, so we are a subsidiary of uh, Fidelity National Financial. And we have a corporate alliance, or I wouldn't say more of an alliance, but a corporate uh, strategy going more into uh, Microsoft piece of it. And the advantage for us is also to leverage 
their uh, on-cloud ML algorithms and everything that they put in there, which comes in handy for us. So with the big insights, what they have deployed in Azure and everything. So that's why uh, we are aligned more towards Microsoft. Yeah.